Hey, Carl here to say that Music to Code By is now an app called Music to Flow By. Now you can listen to the tracks on your phone with offline capability. The first three tracks are free, and the entire catalog is available by subscription with a new track arriving every month. Just go to musictoflowby.com for all the links. Welcome back to .NET Rocks. This is Carl Franklin. And this is Richard Campbell. And uh, we're back in the studio before we head off for London for, uh, what's the heck of that show over there? Is it called London Developer Conference? Oh, no. LDC? That makes no sense. UK Developer Conference. No, it's the Norwegian Developer Conference in London. In the UK, yes. Yes. And I, oddly enough, I'm going to spend a couple of days in Scotland before I get to London. I oh, can't my imagine. stones! <laughs> I can't imagine what I'll do up there. <laughs> and then uh, I am going to Brighton afterwards for a humanitarian toolbox code Very cool. Yeah, I'm super excited about a it. A well-rounded vacation. Uh, from the northern edge of the UK to the southern edge of the UK. Gotta love it. Yep. Hey, and speaking of love it, roll the music for Better Know Framework, because I got something pretty cool. Awesome. <laughs> All right, man, what do you got? My life as a screen scraper. <laughs> That's going to have, I'm going to write my memoir. That's it, huh? <laughs> I was always going to write it, the title mine, forget the world, stop that girl I want to get off, but what? I don't know what that means. <laughs> oh, all right. Go to import.io, www.import.io. It basically, give, you give it a URL and it gives you back the material on that page in JSON format. Wow. Dude, that's super cool. And look who's using it. Who? Well, Microsoft, Amazon. Oh, right. ESPN. Yeah. And Panasonic, Pirelli Tires. Mm-hmm. And then the ever prestigious Amway. Ah, oh, good. Because I need more soap in my life. <laughs> <laughs> soap that I can make money off of my that's friends it. on. Uh, well, anyway, so yeah, that's essentially what you do. And I, I did take it for a spin and they say, okay, give us a URL and you give them a URL and they pull up the page and then they say, all right, now let's make this really work. So you tell them more about the page and where the things are on the page that you want. Interesting. And they use that to, uh, to make the, the data that comes back more accurate. So sort of smarten up the scraper, but it's, I guess it's sort of focused on this idea of you'll, you'll run this over and over again. Yeah, exactly. So you want to get good at something. Right. That's really interesting. Isn't that cool? Turn it into a service. Your world is an API. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. It's all APIs all the way down. All the way down. Like turtles, only different. <laughs> a little faster. There you go. Who's talking to us today, Richard? I uh, grabbed a comment off a of show 1299, the one we did back in May of 2016 with Vittorio Bertocci. The most beautiful man in the world. He has spectacular hair, but so does his wife. They're kind of a yes. match set, actually. Yes. Uh, and we were talking about identity as a service, and I know we're going to spend some time on identity today, so I thought this was particularly relevant, especially this comment from Bastian Tupfler, who said, and I hope I got your last name right, there was an umlaut there, so I was trying to include it. It's a couple of years old, but he says, thanks for the great show. The company I'm currently working, we want to get rid of that old ASP.NET membership provider, and I've been uh -huh. looking for some alternatives. I hope I can get my colleagues to listen to the show and tell you come one of the most important bits of the show, that there are better people than Bob, because everybody has a Bob, mm -hmm. that have already solved this problem, as you pointed out, their entire work time on this topic. I'm a big fan of Identity Server, so are we, for some of my own projects, but I kind of like handing it off completely. I hadn't heard of Azure Active Directory Business to Consumer yet, but I'll start evaluating it right away. And I mean, admittedly, that was two years ago. So, mm. Bastian, I hope you've actually implemented it now and let us present some other possibilities with Daryl Miller. Yeah. And uh, and enjoy our gigantic .NET Rocks coffee mug or mug for anything you want. Mine has tea in it. And a mug is on its way to you. And if you'd like a mug, write a comment on the website at .netrocks.com or via any of our social media because we publish every show to Facebook and Google+. And if you comment there and we read it on the show, we'll send you a mug. And definitely follow us on Twitter. He's at Rich Campbell. I'm at Carl Franklin. Send us a tweet. We shred them. I think I've done that joke before. Hmm. Anytime there's JSON, we shred. Right. 
Yeah. Well, let's bring back Daryl Miller uh, to the show. He's been on before a couple of times, I think at least once. And uh, he's a software developer at Microsoft now, working for the Azure API management team. Uh, Daryl's an active member of the .NET community and an open source contributor. He's a member of the OAI Technical Steering Committee, working on the next version of the Open API specification. Welcome back, Daryl. Thank you very much, folks. It's great to be back. Yeah, great to have you. Open API looks really cool to me. I mean, you guys are essentially trying to standardize some metadata around REST APIs so that it just makes things work better? Yeah, we want to be able to describe uh, a HTTP API and be able to use tools to generate all kinds of things. Most people are probably already familiar with it, but under its older name, which was Swagger. All right. All right. I was going to say Wizdle, but that's because I'm really old. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we, we do get compared to, to WSDL quite often, but there is the fundamental difference that OpenAPI only attempts to describe HTTP APIs and doesn't right. try and do that kind of, we'll describe it abstractly and then we'll bind it at a later point to yeah. a concrete uh, transport. So it makes OpenAPI, or what used to be called Swagger, uh, a little different and a little simpler and easier to use. Sure does. So is the Swagger.io site still relevant to this? It's just changing names? It, it, it is still relevant. And uh, it's relevant because the Swagger name is still around, but now it kind of identifies different things. Uh, the, the, the kind of backstory there is uh, the folks who were working on uh, the Swagger tooling and the Swagger specification went and worked for a company called SmartBear. Right, right. And mm -hmm. uh, so Tony Tam and Ron Ratofsky, mm -hmm. they went and worked for SmartBear. And so SmartBear were sponsoring it. But SmartBear decided that, you know, if they want the standard itself to be truly global and adopted by all kinds of companies, it would be better to be run by a more independent organization. So the specification was moved into the OpenAPI initiative as part of the Linux Foundation. And that group uh, now manages the specification. The term Swagger still exists to describe the tools that SmartBear are building. Uh, so Swagger UI for generating documentation, Swagger Code Gen, uh, all of those great tools that have helped to bring the ecosystem to where it is are still being enhanced and built there. Yeah. But the spec work is all under the umbrella of the Linux Foundation. Well, and kudos to, to SmartBear for being that wise to recognize at some point being under a company impairs the ability for the for a specification like this to go where it needs to go yeah and, and it just it it prevents adoption i mean we we have over 30 member companies now as part of the open api initiative and all the big names of google and sap and right uh, and Adobe and Microsoft are all uh, sponsors, and there's lots of smaller companies too. So we, we have a lot more resources available to us now in order to move the specification forward. That's great. Because yeah. didn't it start with like Capital One and Google and IBM and Microsoft, PayPal, and all these uh, guys that got into it like what, back in the mid, uh, what is it, just a few years ago, I guess, right? 2015 or something that started the whole thing? Ooh, the the open API initiative. Yeah. It's it's been about two years now. Yes, yeah. Uh, that that it's uh, it's been around, and it's we're we're growing quite quickly as as an organization. And in fact, middle of last year, we released the Open API V three, so the next major version of what used to be Swagger, and uh, added a bunch of cool functionality into that. And now we are presently working on a kind of 3.1 because we decided to go with the whole semantic versioning. So hopefully we'll be able to bring new non-breaking features uh, into an updated spec uh, much sooner than was we were able to before. Nice. All right. What is this really? like? They, <laughs> <laughs> What's you know, going on? What is it? <laughs> yeah. What is all this crazy stuff? Like uh, APIs are APIs. What makes them open? What makes them open? What makes them open is that 
anybody can call that API, assuming you have the appropriate permissions. I mean, HTTP is the ubiquitous protocol. Like, what platform doesn't support HTTP? Mm, right. uh, so you can take your business functionality, your business data, and share it with partners and make those services accessible to anybody on any platform. Uh, so I think that's where really the openness is. And then you can look at the fact that uh, Open API is is part of the Linux Foundation. As far as contributing, there is you don't have to be a member to contribute. In fact, uh, the technical steering committee, where people are actually elected on to actually make the final decisions as to what goes in and out of the spec, are not necessarily part of the member companies. Mm -hmm. That's been kept very specifically, intentionally separate. Mm -hmm. So the technical side of things is not steered by uh, the the, the the money that goes into the sponsorship goes to promoting and on the marketing side. But on the technical side of things, anybody can contribute. Anybody can go to the GitHub repo, mm. create issues. They can create pull requests, and they can become uh, once they demonstrate an active involvement and are interested, they can become part of the technical steering committee. Regardless, like there is no pay for play uh, that goes on in this organization. So I think those are the aspects of it that make it open for me. Nice. I like the way the spec is published on GitHub and it's just right there, easy to understand, easy to read, easy to contribute to. Uh, it's a really good use of GitHub. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's the watering hole, right? Where yeah. everybody comes to when it comes for, for, for tech stuff. So Yeah, sure. So what are the kinds of things that you would decorate a REST service with that would be compliant and in and then we'll take it from there. Just let, give me some examples of uh, what what kinds of stuff is in there. Well, I mean, you're you're looking to be able to take advantage of the tooling ecosystem that has been built around. I mean, no developer really really enjoys writing documentation for their API, right? Mm -hmm. But you kind of have to. Uh, so part of the role of uh, an open API description is providing that structure, des describing the semantics of the API, describing the data models that are passed backwards and forwards, and being able to annotate those with human-readable descriptions. And then there's tooling that will then take that API description, the minimalistic API description, and generate really nice HTML documentation that also has these kind of nice features like the try it so that somebody can go up to the documentation page and go, I'm interested in using this particular API. Here, let's actually give it a go. And you can have the HTML documentation actually have a button where you press the button and it goes and gets an authentication key and actually calls the API so you can actually see it in action. And you can fill in different parameters in order to be able to see how the, the API responds when you provide different input data. So it kind of reminds me of the what we would decorate a method with or a class with in in comments in C sharp or VB. And you know, where you have you describe the method and then you describe every input and you describe the output and you have a sort of uh, description of what this method does. That that kind of metadata, right? Yeah, and, and that is a quite fabulous segue into another whole area in that uh, as part of this process of me getting involved in the open API, I started building some tooling and working at Microsoft, talking to other teams. There were other teams within Microsoft who were also interested in supporting the open API v3. Uh, and we have kind of got together and built a common set of tooling. And one of those teams uh, over in the Universal Store group uh, were actually doing exactly what you described. They want to be able to take XML comments in your code and take those additional annotations and use it to generate an open API document directly. Wow. So that is exactly how it's going to work. Uh, but you'll have a much richer set of comments that you can annotate on your method and then auto-generate the open API document from those XML comments. That's really cool. Does the spec go so far as to tell us how to define the names of our, um, you know, APIs and like naming conventions or, or anything like that? Or is it just, you know, we're going to fit in within the constructs of basic REST principles? It, 
this is it, it's actually an interesting whole conversation as as to how opinionated open API right. is um, and it, it there are some opinions that, that in there as to sort of how we think an open API should be built in the simplest way uh, or an HTTP API but as we add more capability we're kind of um, supporting more and more scenarios we don't have any major uh, guidance with regards to naming other than the fact that we don't allow you to use certain characters, uh, you know, certain syntax in there that we know kind of trips people up. So we limit uh, certain characters within certain elements within your API, but we don't go as far as to tell you this is what you should name things and whether you should put S's on the end of things and yeah do you care you about camel case do you care about pluralization like none of that really all of matters. these things that next thing you know you're talking about spaces and tabs <laughs> yeah, yeah we don't want to get into those uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> i'm looking at an example uh because he has some great yaml examples of of these things and there's a uh, there's one for the data set api with with uber what is that all about uh, we we uh, do have a number of different example APIs. Uh, actually, you'll, you'll find in the latest release that Uber example has disappeared. We Aww. decided to find <laughs> a, a, a more politically correct uh, example. Yeah. Maybe we should talk about the pet store example. <laughs> Pets are lovely. Kitties. Kitties are go. harmless. You're fine. Um. I actually think the the new one that got added was related to postal services. I, I it's funny I don't remember what the new one that we added as a replacement example. Right. Um, but you you bring up the fact that it's it's we we use YAML and this is one of the things we we support both. You can use JSON, you can use YAML, whichever you prefer. Um, Although most people who spend any time working, actually creating these documents manually, end up uh, moving towards the YAML side of things. Well, you can read it. Yeah, I mean, there's not yeah. a lot of ceremony there. Yeah, yeah, but it brings up the other interesting areas. Like some people do this kind of in a contract first way, mm. and other people do it in an implementation first, and then generate the open API as an artifact, and. Both approaches are supported, and uh, it's basically just a preference. Whatever fits into your workflow the best. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's easy. This is not terribly complicated stuff. It's just important to get it right. It, well, it, it, the more the more descriptive you can be, the mm -hmm. easier it is for developers to be able to onboard onto your API. And, and right. adoption is is a key thing, right? When you're trying, to, especially if you're a company that is trying to be product as an API as a product, you know, your Stripe right. or something like that. Uh, th that's what they sell. So you want it as easy as possible for customers to be able to consume those APIs. And and going back to the the comment I read earlier, you know, the, here are schemas for security scheme, OAuth, flows, and flow, and and security requirements. So you know, right away you've got some standards to work from. Yeah, absolutely. And we we also in the V3 we added support for pointing to an Open ID Connect uh, mm -hmm. discovery URL. So that requires a little less metadata to mm, be put into yeah. uh, APIs. Right. Uh, so uh, and the 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 real value in in having those security things is it helps to drive that kind of try this uh, functionality because you can't let somebody call a production API uh, unless they actually have some kind of security key. So right. you need to be able to uh, provide sufficient metadata to the tooling that is driven by Open API in order to be able to ask the user, okay, give me some some identity so they can actually start calling uh, the uh, the APIs. Yeah. Well, and it's one of those, everybody needs to do this and each platform you go to does it a little bit differently. Yes. Yeah. Well, OpenID Connect is supposed to help with some of that variability. It certainly was yeah. a problem with OAuth 1. And that's one of the, the, it's been a contentious issue is a lot of folks have asked us to add in OAuth 1 support. Mm. And it's been one of those, okay. And we've had some good PRs from the community with regards to that. Mm -hmm. But it's like, we just 
you know, every time we ask about some edge case of, of OAuth 1, it's like, yeah, well, there's this custom thing that's done for that particular API. Yeah, okay, right. well, that's not work. So we're yeah. still looking for more people to try to help us out with trying to nail down something that we can add in to OAuth 1. Because the thing is, every time we add something into the spec, there's a certain expectation that tool vendors are going to support that capability. Because right. the last thing you want to do is come up to a tool and use a spec and the tool go, yeah, no, I don't support that particular spec. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. extremely frustrating, right? So we always have to be super careful when we're adding new functionality into the spec that tooling folks are going to be able to actually produce that. Because a lot of these tools that are built, they're built as open source tools uh, that you know people are doing in their spare time. I mean, sure. there is a commercial ecosystem around it too. Mm-hmm. Um, some people bring it, building some great design tools for, for designing APIs visually. Uh, but uh, there's also a lot of open source stuff that drives this. Is there any guidance for how one should go about testing REST APIs, whether you should make test services or whether we should do mocks on the client side or... How, is there anything in there about that, or is that just basic common horse sense? We we don't have anything specifically in the Open API spec other than the ability to include example requests and example bodies. And there are tools that have been created that um, allow you to. Uh, take an open API description and then use those examples as sample inputs. And then the testing tool will compare those inputs with the outputs. Uh, there's some, uh, one of the tools from API called Dread, which was originally built around API Blueprint. Uh, and now, uh, they also support, uh, open API. Uh, they can do it. There's another, uh, HTTP master is another tool that does it. Uh, SmartBear themselves build testing tools oh, cool. uh, for APIs also. So the, the, there's lots of companies out there uh, that are building tooling around the space. And the interesting thing, too, is like I have mentioned that api uh, now also support open API. For hmm. quite a number of years, there was this which format is going to win type of scenario yeah. and you had MuleSoft had RAML and API Ari had API Blueprint and uh, back in the day Mashery had their IO docs and I feel like I'm desperately forgetting one oh, of the major right. formats that I can't remember. <laughs> that's, it's but, quite alright um, Daryl and in fact we need to take a slight pause for an important message. Yes. Hey Rockheads this is Carl. Have you tried JetBrains Rider? It's a new cross-platform .NET IDE that's light yet powerful and comes from the makers of ReSharper, IntelliJ, IDEA, and WebStorm. You can write .NET code on Windows, Mac, or Linux. Rider has you covered. Rider helps you develop ASP.NET, .NET Core, .NET Framework, Xamarin, and Unity applications. Most languages used in .NET development are supported. From C Sharp, VBNet, F Sharp, and XAML to ASP.NET Razor syntax, JavaScript, TypeScript, and all that other front end stuff. It comes with navigation, thousands of code inspections, refactorings, unit testing, debugging, rich coding assistance, and more advanced IDE features powered by proven technology from ReSharper and WebStorm. Download Rider now and take it for a 30 day trial at rider.com. Dot .netrocks.com. That's R I D E R dot D O T N E T R O C K S dot com. And we're back. It's dot net rocks. Carl and Richard here talking to Daryl Miller about Open API. And uh, yeah, you're right. There was a time when it felt like everybody was trying to come up with a solution to this. It, right. There's got to be one right way. But it's, you know, it seems like just looking cursorily at the specification, you know, the acceptance of both JSON and YAML is sort of an acknowledgement that uh, we can all get along. It's We're not that far apart. Yeah. yeah, and all of the other tooling folks who are building other specs are now part of the Open API initiative. MuleSoft have joined with RAML, and they've found a good balance of where using RAML for application modeling and then having Open API at the edge. And API are now supporting uh, Open API in in much of their tooling, and then even even over in the Microsoft space, uh, you know, we have. 
Uh, OData was was the sure. was the language. I mean, Microsoft Graph is built on OData, and one of the other teams that got involved with us in building this common set of OpenAPI.NET tooling was from the identity division, who now own uh, uh, the all of the OData libraries, and they've built a reader that will take the OData description, which is called CSDL, and will convert that into an Open API format. Nice. And so now they're going to be able to plug that into other tool chains. Like we have tool chains for the docs.microsoft.com that generate API reference documentation automatically from Open mm. API. So the Microsoft Graph is going to be able to plug into that. We have our auto rest tooling for generating client libraries, and the graph's going to be able to take advantage of that in the future. So you see that pattern over and over, right? I mean, you come up with a spec, you come up with a standard, and then everybody re- gets around that standard. And then things like that just happen. Oh, I had no idea we could do that. Yeah, because we have a standard now. You you make it sound so easy. <laughs> well, that's that's what happens. It's not easy, but that's certainly what happens. The real challenge is keeping the spec simple whilst providing everybody with the features that everybody wants. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, that's, that's always the battle, isn't it? Yeah. It's, if yeah. it's sophisticated enough to cover all possibilities, it's too complicated to use. And if it's simple enough to use, it doesn't cover all the possibilities. I can think of a few standards that were so complicated that there were s- so many versions of them and it turned it turned out to defeat the purpose. SCSI comes to mind. Hmm. Yeah. Even USB suffers from that a little bit. Mm-hmm. SQL. SQL. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Hey, heaven help you if you you know if you're good at writing T SQL and you've got to switch over to Oracle or DB2 like surprise they're not the same. So yeah, I think it's a real challenging balancing act to to sort of carve off what are the consistent things between the different product stacks, different approaches that the you know stuff like OAuth and and security. And I'm looking at the list here, so parameters and request and response, like, and not carve off the things that are specific. Yeah, and in in the V3 spec, we, I mean, one of the easy ones to make the decision on was to add support for callbacks. Right. So kind of webhooks, because webhooks have become such a prevalent uh, approach oh, yeah. uh, for having a certain amount of everybody wants. Them. Yeah, and 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 that was that was a fairly easy thing to add, but uh, we also added the notion of links. Because there's a lot of people who, uh, you know, coming from the hypermedia world who have difficulty with documentation issues and they'd like uh, open API to support more hypermedia type environment. And mm-hmm. we didn't go all that far. Uh, oh. we, we don't, you can do hypermedia, but there's a bit of a uh, contradiction because hypermedia is all about dynamic runtime discovery right. and open api is about design time discovery so mm-hmm. how do you reconcile those two <laughs> so what we actually did do is introduce the notion of links uh, that are static design time links so it's basically saying when you make a call to this particular url and this operation you're going to get back some information and that information will provide enough parameters to be able to drive this other operation so right. we can connect together the operations within the document now using this notion of links. And what I'm sort of really looking forward to is when people start taking advantage of the describing that set of links within the operations and generating documentation and being able to actually surface that in documentation. So you can go to a document and instead of just getting, here's my flat list of operations that are available in this API. Now I can say, oh, here's a good starting point that I have the information for that. Mm-hmm. Now, where can I go from here and discover and actually walk through the documentation in a much more scenario-driven way rather than just being reference? Well, it, it sounds like you can let them get gradually pregnant. Like, here's the, the first right. two calls you need to know how to use, and then you're going to run into, I need to do more, so that'll be the next set of things you need to learn. Is that sort of where extensions come in for open API? Because, I mean, I, the, the worst thing that you can do when adopting a standard is be locked into to certain things that you can't extend. And I don't think you guys do that. So you have an extension model. We have an extension model, and a lot of the objects within OpenAPI just have this uh, rule that says, you can add any property that you want, just prefix it with x dash. 
Right. Uh, and tooling knows it either understands that special extension because it's been custom built and it's become popular enough to be supported, uh, or, um, just, just ignore it. Yeah. And so far that's worked really well for us insofar as allowing people to add in their own, uh, custom metadata within the API without breaking uh, existing tooling. So, so far. And, and it's great because as we see adoption of a particular extension, we can start considering that for the next version of the spec. Interesting. Yeah. So is there a way for you as the, specification working group to see what people are using or do you have to they sort of have to push against you we have a number of people in the community who've been basically trolling the internet looking for existing descriptions and then cataloging one of the things on our to-do list is kind of produce a a central repository of these are all of the extensions that people are using out there uh and this is what they're using them for because what we just want to try and avoid is two people using the same extension name for two completely different purposes right so the idea is to create this kind of registry where people can go. And there are some existing ones that people have done themselves and put a lot of uh, v- or add a lot of value to. Uh, I think APIs.guru has uh, some great directories there. And uh, we want to just kind of centralize that, uh, steal their work, as it were. Not um, UDDI. To- oh, no. <laughs> Well, that's another whole conversation that <laughs> we would be really interested in because discovery uh. is very much... Another major issue, we don't address it in OpenAPI, yeah. but there is another spec called APIs.json oh, yeah. that does uh, attempt to address the discovery thing. And there's conversations going on in the OpenAPI initiative at the moment is, you know, should we broaden our scope? Should we try and do more than just describe REST API? Should we get into the business of trying to standardize on discovery? Uh, and another area is event-based there's lots of hunger for being able to describe uh, message-based and event-based uh, APIs, which we currently don't do in Open API. And there's a format called Async API that uh, some folks from Spain have worked on that mirrors a lot of what Open API v3 does, uh, but then uh, doesn't describe paths. Instead, it describes messages and topics and events. So lots of thought going into how we can both help those efforts and how we can expand the charter of the Open API initiative. That's awesome. Yeah, I know. Hey, Richard. Yeah, buddy. Guess what time it is? It must be that happy time again. It's time to talk about my new children's book called Make Way for Rest Services, featuring eight restful ducklings, Jappy, Cappy, Lappy, Mappy, Nappy, Oappy, Pappy, and Quappy. <laughs> It takes place in Boston, by the way. And it's actually time to give away a D-Experience subscription from our good friends at DevExpress to one lucky member of the .NET Rocks fan club. Become a UI superhero with DevExpress UI controls and libraries and deliver elegant .NET solutions that address customer needs today and leverage your existing knowledge to build next-generation touch-enabled solutions for tomorrow. Whether it's an Office-inspired application or a data-centric analytics dashboard, DevExpress Universal ships with everything you'll need to build your best without limits or compromise. And check out their DevExtreme React grid, built from the ground up to fully support all the cool features that come with React, like the virtual DOM and state controllers like Redux. It supports master detail, sorting, grouping, paging, and editing. You can check it out and test it for free on GitHub, Learn more and download your free 30-day trial of DevExpress Universal at devexpress.com slash superhero. Well, all right, buddy. Who's our winner? Today's winner is Mark Ott. Congratulations, Mark. Mark Ott. Go clap for you, sir. Yes, go clap for Mark. And he just won the D-Experience subscription, a big pile of awesome from our friends at DevExpress, just for being a member of the .NET Rocks fan club. And if you don't know what that is, go to .NET Rocks.com, click on the big Get Free Stuff button, answer a few questions, and join the fan club. We have thousands of members all over the world, and every show we like to give away stuff from our sponsors, and every December we give away a $5,000 technology shopping spree to one lucky member of said fan club, but you have to sign up to win. And we also like to ask our guest, Daryl, if you remember from last time, if you had $5,000 to spend on technology right now, what would you buy? 
And I, I, I knew this question was coming, and I thought about it, and I really struggled to come up with it. I'm really not that much of a gadget guy, but I really could use a nice Surface Book with a whole whack load of RAM. That oh, would yeah. really, really be nice. I love a and, good whack load of RAM. <laughs> yes, yes. The other thing would be some nice wireless, like the Sona speakers in my house, so I mm-hmm. never have to run another speaker cable ever yes. again. That that would be good for me. It's a primitive concept, running wires now. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I've, I've been looking at converting my wired system over to a Sonos, mostly just for a good tablet interface. Because all the other approaches are just too painful to do. But, and you could spend a lot of money on Sonos gear. Those speakers and things are not cheap, yeah. but they do a lot. They sound great. That's why I don't own any at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> it's only if we coughed up the money for you, right? Yeah, that's right. There you go. That makes a lot of sense to me. Wow. So, is Microsoft internally implementing open API stuff? Is that is that important to them? Oh, it's massively important. I mean, if you uh, just my own team, we import uh, open API descriptions for bringing in APIs. We export it to be able to generate clients. Uh, t- tools like uh, Logic Apps use it. Power mm-hmm. Apps use it. Uh, I mean, ASP Net, they have the export and web API using the Swashbuckle Toolkit to generate open API. It's used all over the place within the company uh, and more and more all of the time. Interesting. I mentioned before about the, the docs. Uh, all of our API docs are now automatically generated. Mm-hmm. All of the management APIs for Azure uh, we have to describe all of uh, the management APIs using an open API description, and mm. then we generate both the .NET and PowerShell clients from that, and then the clients for all the other languages, the Go and the Ruby and Python, yeah. all get generated off those open API descriptions. That's good. Yeah, and I'm just poking around in GitHub here, and yeah, you're, you're merging pull requests. Yeah, that's, that's how our... Azure service teams add new features to the API. We go to GitHub, we edit the open API document, and we do a PR, and the team uh, that manages the SDKs reviews those PRs. We It all mm-hmm. happens out in the public. Yeah, with conversation, I'm sure. Yeah. How can people get involved? With open API, join yeah. us on the, the, the GitHub repo. Uh, it's OAI slash open API specification on GitHub. And uh, we just have issues. We uh, recommend people to open issues when they have questions about things or they have concerns, problems, they have features that they want. Spec out things. Show us how you would add something to it. And you can also create pull requests uh, against our future branches, our future spec branches. Uh, The other thing that we find for where there are bigger issues where people have presented us with some idea and we want to discuss with it further. We generally have weekly meetings on a Friday uh, and we encourage people to come and join us and uh, share their ideas and we'll ask them questions and get feedback and then slowly move it into the process of actually getting it incorporated into the spec. I see that there's a quite a few um, tooling implementations using the 3.0 spec that are also on GitHub. That, um, that's another opportunity to, to jump in, isn't it? Absolutely, yes. Uh, and there are open API tools out there that only support the V2, so there's, there's work to be done on converting it over. There are people who are creating new tools uh, from scratch for the for open API V3 who are looking mm-hmm. for people to contribute. Uh, we, we currently have that list of implementations as just a a directory of these are people working on the stuff. Uh, There is a hope in the future to try and, and I say this word carefully, kind of do a certification type of thingy Ah. to say open API has reviewed this tool and yes, it is compliant with the specification to give some kind of quality indicator. Uh, The tools that are currently there the only guarantee that we give you that we are listing is we know they're working on V3. Um, we haven't gone any further at this point with regards to any kind of verification process. Well, it sounds like a feature of what you were talking about earlier, creating a catalog of what's implementing open API mm-hmm. and, yeah. and saying, yeah, and this is the level that they're currently implemented at. And 
maybe efforts are going on for the next level, that kind of thing. A little sanctification. Yeah, there's, there's pros and cons to that whole process. But uh, the one thing that, from my perspective, we're kind of very strict on is we we in the OAI are only talking about the spec. There is no single reference implementation. Right, no code. There's no code. No tools. We just provide you with the spec. So we pick no favorites. Uh, I think that's really important, too, because it can. It, as soon as you get into code, it gets somehow more personal. Well, you also end up with the unfortunate side effect of the spec doesn't become the source of truth anymore. Right, it becomes right. the reference implementation that is the source of truth. And then you accidentally end up defining behavior because that's the way that tech happens to work. Uh, and then it becomes a problem for people on other platforms to potentially duplicate that. But validating an implementation to say this is compliant with 2.0, that needs some code. Somehow it's got to test it. Well, yes, that's definitely the question. When we get into that validation process, we are going to need uh, at minimum a set of reference tests yeah. that says when this is the input, this is what the output should be. Uh, one of the reasons why we're not there yet to being able to say, yes, this is validated and certified. Right. But if that's important to you, come help. Yeah, no right. kidding. So speaking of implementations, is there a .NET implementation? There, are there samples we could work from? There absolutely is a, a .NET implementation that is in a preview state. Uh, it's on the GitHub repo Microsoft slash openAPI.net. And uh, we're enthusiastic for people to come try it out and uh, give us feedback as to what you like, what you don't like. As I say, it is, it's still in a, a preview phase. So th there's kind of two aspects to it. There's the core model, which basically just gives you an object model to create a document and then a writer. And then we have a separate project, which is a reader that will read in uh, YAML and JSON type formats. And we'll read in 2.0 and we'll read in 3.0 version and we'll output either. So if you're working with tooling that only supports 2.0, but you'd like to start playing around writing stuff in 3.0, you can do that and then just use our tool to do that conversion for you. Uh, so yes, we definitely have tooling that we're working on and would love to hear people's feedback. And th the plan is, is to build this kind of central single object model and writer and validation rules so that other people can go out and build tools on it and we all get a consistent experience. Right. Because Microsoft has kind of that habit of doing things differently in different parts of the company and now we're a one Microsoft. We don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> yeah, in, in, interesting challenge. It's such a yeah. big organization, though. Like, you can't create a gatekeeper for that sort of thing. You'd never get anything done. No. Yeah. So you got to sort of count on everyone doing the right thing, which gets back to the sort of reference implementations and validators. To just say, can you make this part of your test process that it validates the OpenAPI 3.0? That, that to me, seems a very, very useful tool to have if, if you if architecturally decide this is important. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of work that goes into that. But th there's also when, when you're building libraries around um, specifications, there's, there's different ways that you can surface that capability. And if different teams have different requirements, they'll end up building a model that looks different. Uh, and it's just repeated effort. Right. Uh, and you'll end up with, well, that team didn't validate for that particular scenario. And another team mm. did. And so it, it, it just is, is wasted effort if we're re-implementing that stuff over and over again within the company. Yeah. So, Daryl, you live in the Azure API management group. Yes. That's a lot of different things. I mean, we've talked about the API management from the perspective of how do you put governance in front of your API for billing and DDoS attacks and things like that. Do you solely focus on a, uh, open API or are you working across the, the, the larger API management group? Well, our API management product supports doing descriptions in a variety of different formats. We'll, mm -hmm. We import Waddle, if anybody remembers Waddle. Oh, yeah. uh, we import uh, Open API, obviously. I'm working on the feature to add support for implementing Open API v3, and I will be using the Open API.net library uh, to do that uh, integration. Uh, we also added support last year for importing Wistle. 
Uh, I did the uh, a chunk of that implementation and got to spend a lovely amount of time dealing with uh, Wizdal and SOAP implementations because nice. real wow. companies still have lots of APIs out there. Yeah, You know, um, I was really looking forward to this show never talking about XML. I think you brought <laughs> it up, Richard. You were the first one to make the Wizdal <laughs> joke. I was the first one to say Wizdal. I admit it. I did say that. That's me. But, you know, isn't it interesting? Here we are talking about messaging and, and API communication and so forth. And the focus is simply not on XML anymore. Yeah. No. Yeah. And I mean, we, we actually have a transformation because our product is sort of kind of, it's a proxy, right? A gateway where requests come in at one end and then they actually call your backend API and mm -hmm. we can do transformation. So you can actually let consumers call just using regular HTTP methods and JSON and we'll do that transformation to SOAP on the back end. Uh, and that's what a lot of customers uh, are using to do that. In fact, we implemented that stuff and then the Logic Apps folks said, hey, that would be really useful if we could do it in Logic Apps too. So now the Logic Apps folks are working with us and they're contributing to that code base and also integrating it within the Logic Apps capability so that uh, you can call SOAP APIs on the back end from your Logic Apps. Neat. Yeah. Well, and it's, yep. I think you're right. It, it just needs to be a bridge, right? Like they're never going to get away from each other, really. We're never going to be XML free ever. Well, but at least we can know who we're calling and make it easy for people to uh, to get get going with it. And I think that's what you guys are doing. It's fantastic work you're doing. I noticed looking at the contributors for uh, for the uh, OpenAPI.net that the number of contributors guy named Sam Hugh, uh, mm -hmm. who's connected to Microsoft O data. Yes. Yes. That's cause nice. That's the reader. They wanted to write the converter from CSDL over. Right. And uh, Sam's done a lot of contributions. Uh, and Perth, the other contributor, is from the Windows Universal Store team. And, uh, yeah, we've kind of created that kind of V team across the company. And we've been working on uh, uh, this together. Well, and I, you know, you talk about Open Microsoft. What an example to see the OData guy, the store guy, the Azure APIs guy, like you're clearly coming at it from different places inside of Microsoft and all landing on the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, And because there's a common need and there's a common spec, we're able to do it, right? Because we're just writing against that spec. And then each of those teams have written their own reader. The OData folks have written a CDS little reader. The uh, Universal Store have written the reader that reads from the C-sharp comments because mm -hmm. that met their goal. But we all shared the same common model and writer. Right, right. And validation. You're not duplicating things that in, any more than absolutely necessary that the, you have different versions and needs for things. Yep. Yeah, very yeah. good. Very cool stuff. So, uh, Daryl, what's in your inbox? What's next for you? Oh, I'm, I've got so many things to work on with regards to Open API and Open API V3. And there's, I have so many ideas for tooling that I want to do, especially on, well, two aspects. One on the client side. Uh, where imagine the idea of instead of code generating this big SDK for calling an API, imagine a small library that just loads in open API as a description yeah, and loads it in as metadata yeah. and then just exposes a bunch of methods you can call and say, well, I want to call this operation over here. And here's just a uh, anonymous object with the parameters to fill in just a and dynamic. just make the call. Dynamically done, just all the way down. Dynamically driven off the, the the O data, and then when the Open API description on the server side changes, well, just load in that updated one. Yeah, I mean, nice. again, I'm oversimplifying. There are challenges there, but uh, that's one area that I'd really like to explore. And the other side is on the server side. Uh, this was actually one of the things that got me interested in OpenAPI and Swagger in the first place. Tony Tam did a demo of a product called Swagger Inflector. Hmm. And you use it on the server side and you get an incoming request and you actually do a lookup in the OpenAPI uh, description. And there's a piece of metadata. There's an X dash in there that tells you what controller will handle that operation. Yeah. So the OpenAPI now does the routing for you. And I've I've done uh, some prototypes of this in ASP.NET, and I'd love to do it in ASP.NET Core, where you just load in uh, a open API 
documentation. And instead of annotating the open API doc, I think I'd do it with an attribute yeah, sure. on a method and say, this attribute on this method is going to handle this particular uh, open API operation description. And guess what? Open API has all the information you need for routing. It has all the parameters, all the data types you need for model binding and validation of the, those incoming parameters. So instead of loading up that method, that action, with a whole bunch of different attributes for all kinds of different reasons, you just point to the open API document and it has all the metadata that you need about what are the inbound information and what is going to be the outbound information. Boy, that's awesome. That so, covers a whole host of sins right there. I would love to see that. Happen. Yeah, I would love to see that too. That's awesome. Wow. Well, when you get that working, come back and talk to us. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> I, I would love to. All right, Daryl, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. And to you two guys. All right. And we'll see you next time on .NET Rocks. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Plop Studios a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and, of course, in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one, recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got a transmitter band by the FCC.